It is good to see so many of you here. Um, many familiar faces, some I haven't seen in a very long while. Let me especially acknowledge my brother, Clem John, who's here, who repatriated to Grenada some couple of decades at least ago, having been a youth officer in the London Borough of Brent. Um, he's visiting, and um, I think he had his arm twisted to turn up here this evening. Welcome, my friend. <clears throat> so, friends, in this talk I want to share and headline a few issues. Time doesn't allow for me to elaborate upon them in any depth. And hopefully, because Christine has put me under heavy manners, there would be time for us to revisit some of them at the end of this talk. I've chosen to call the presentation Decolonizing the Curriculum, Transforming the Academy, because I believe that decolonizing the curriculum is not a mechanistic exercise. It is not an exercise in tinkering with reading lists or teaching in a manner that is more inclusive of students from the African and Asian diaspora. It requires that the academy transform and decolonize itself, especially its culture, its ethos, its values, and its management. The first of these issues I want to headline is what I believe to be the purpose of schooling and education. As someone who's been involved in education all my life, as a student, as a parent of students, as an education manager, and as a teacher educator, I believe that the primary and ultimate function and purpose of schooling and education is to humanize society. I've always considered human liberation the most essential function we as human beings are called upon to fulfill and make our purpose. Human liberation and affirming and respecting the sanctity of our humanity in its essence is what defines the imperative that all nations and peoples have, however primordial or so-called developed and modern they might consider themselves to be. My guru, the late Paulo Freire, famously said, education does not change society. Education changes people. People change society. That is why I've always believed that the primary and ultimate function and purpose of schooling and education is to humanize society, not to recycle and per perpetuate elitism and widen social divisions. Everything else should flow from that. And there's no doubt in my mind that white Britain was and is desperately in need of humanizing on account of its understanding and treatment of racialized groups and its lack of understanding of the impact of racism on itself etched into its DNA as it has become over time. For history teaches us, my friends, that the left behinds have a way of coming back and stinging us in the backside. Now, this is evidently not the starting point for most leaders and managers in schooling and education, let alone for education ministers. I argue, however, that leaders and managers in education have a duty to be seen to act with moral purpose as a matter of individual responsibility not only to ensure that no student is left behind, but that as leaders and managers, they have the knowledge, understanding, competence, and aptitudes to tackle the structural, cultural, institutional, and personal manifestations of prejudice and discrimination 
that are part of the web and weave of this society and its institutions, and to lead the process of creating and sustaining an environment in which everyone could feel safe and free from those forms of discrimination. My second premise is that in addition to acting with moral purpose, leaders and managers have a legal obligation to eliminate unlawful discrimination and foster good relations between people defined by whatever their profile might be. The law is a lever for doing just that and for enabling the institution to build and sustain a culture of equity. I emphasize leading and managing with moral purpose because it really should not matter whether Big Brother is keeping tabs on you and monitoring your, your, your legal compliance. You have a duty to ensure that you are doing the right thing for all your staff and students with or without protected characteristics, without being coerced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, by Ofsted, by the Office for Students, or by the likelihood of not getting a race equality charter mark or an Athena Swan badge. <laughs> that legal obligation relates to curriculum and pedagogy as to all the other functions the education sector performs that have relevance for the public sector equality duty as defined by the Equality Act 2010. My third premise is that education providers, whether they be schools or universities, perform a critical societal function. And it is therefore absurd to suggest that they are neutral spaces, free from political and ideological agendas or external influences. No one can convince me that the academization program is anything but ideological. Or that the whole scale adoption of neo-cultural policies and values, not least of all by the HE sector itself, has got nothing at all to do with politics and ideology. So, consider the implications of having black students concentrated in the post-1992 universities, the former polytechnics and colleges of higher education, as distinct from the Russell Group institutions. It is not all that long ago that one such newer university here in London was found to have more black students than all the Russell Group universities put together. In a brilliant and hugely important paper titled how Black Deficit Entered the Academy, my friend Professor Robbie Shilliam wrote in 2016 in relation to this issue, and I quote, take also the contemporary situation that defines the marked increase of black students within the halls of higher learning. They are recruited into less prestigious institutions at percentages higher than any other ethnicity, their experience of higher education is significantly more negative than any other ethnicity, and their attainments are significantly lower than any other ethnicity. Chilliam was writing in Black Academia in July 2010. He goes on to say, some have explained away the these disparities by presuming that presuming that black students arrive at the gates of university with pronounced social and cultural deficits garnered from the familial and community upbringings, i.e. their blackness. And yet all the evidence so far points to the fact that these racialized differentials are in the main produced within the British Academy and cannot be accounted for in terms of the deficits that black students bring with them to the gates of higher learning, end quote. But my friends, let's face it. Men of letters, typically white men with letters behind their names, have always been regarded as those who had an entitlement to run the country, regulate our affairs, 
and secure the continuous thread of elitism in the society. Those letters are conferred by universities. But the elitism is structured in the schooling system as in the social and cultural capital that is so unevenly distributed and so unevenly accessible among school children. The system therefore trundles on with encrusted institutions such as Oxbridge, the Church of England, the monarchy, the judiciary, and the Freemasons, when they are not one and the same, <laughs> continuing to represent Britain in its essence. If you want to understand Brexit, think empire. Think post-imperial and post-industrial Britain, ill at ease with itself, racist, xenophobic, increasingly Islamophobic, and still mourning the demise of the Britannia that once ruled the waves. Cries of revolution, taking our country back, and other such jingoistic drivel <laughs> that fell from the mouths of UKIP and far too many of the Leave Brigade were accompanied not just by the brutal murder of Joe Cox one week before this referendum, but by mass, mass deportations of black folk who had lived all their lives here in Britain, some even born here, whose parents had not taken steps to make sure that they wouldn't end up undocumented and effectively stateless, especially given the overrepresentative number of us in the prison system. David Cameron, and I'm sure you remember him, <laughs> was anything, was being anything but philanthropic, nor was he discharging Britain's duty of care to its former colony, when he boldly offered the Jamaican government 25 million pounds to build a new prison complex. He was a British leader of state abroad, taking care of business, not Jamaica's business, but Britain's business, and ensuring that Jamaica had the capacity to contain all those prisoners he intended that Britain should repatriate, whether born or naturalized in Britain or not. So given the role the higher education sector has always played in the society, given that more and more employers, including the National Health Service and the police, not to mention local councils, are demanding degrees as an essential criterion for employment, how is the sector preparing its graduates and postgraduates for managing their lives in global Britain, let alone managing the country and actively taking charge of its future? How have they prepared the, the present and former leaders of the nation and its institutions, including the still almost exclusively white and male leadership teams within universities, to lead and manage multi-ethnic and increasingly multi-faith Britain? How is it demonstrating that it is capable of providing international students with a learning, social, and developmental experience that speaks to their realities and challenges, rather than one which projects education at a British university as a unique privilege that you pay for in exchange for a white, Eurocentric curriculum and pedagogy that effectively positions them to undergird, if not expand, elitism and all its blandishments back home. What hope do we have? that the HE sector will make a better fist of all of that than they have done over time with respect to confronting class and gender oppression, to name but two. As I see it, a major problem has been a widespread reluctance to deal with the R word, especially since the Second World War. And when good old Enoch Powell dared to shout it out 50 years ago, in language more grand, more elegant, and more direct, than Nigel Farage, UKIP, and those on the right in both the Conservative and Labour parties, but effectively conveying the very same message, the establishment denounced him as being a pariah, even though they continued to pass laws and operate policies that flowed directly from Powell's rhetoric. This is but one example of the hubris to which we have all grown accustomed. <laughs>
The stark and cruel irony, though, is that the rivers of blood Powell feared have come to pass all right, not as a result of race wars, but as a result of grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the so-called Windrush generation routinely slaughtering one another on the nation's streets. Small wonder, then, that rather than confronting race, sex, same-sex, disability, and class discrimination, the state, its institutions, and civil society took to stroking the soft underbelly of the beast and to call it diversity. All of a sudden, Britain, which had always been diverse on the axis of class, God knows, economic status, culture, gender, disability, and access to opportunity, prioritized promoting diversity, raising awareness of diversity, celebrating diversity, and engineering diversity. So increasingly, both in public discourse and in corporate and strategic planning documents, valuing diversity is presented as a proxy for combating discrimination, eliminating barriers, and promoting equity. But as I observed in a policy critique in 2004, which I called the problem with diversity, diversity is a fact of life. You don't have to manufacture it. It becomes an issue only in relation to the hegemony of normal and the process of othering and exclusion and the belief that you treat people equally by treating them all the same. Valuing diversity is not the same as promoting race equality, gender equality, disability equality, etc. The latter cannot be done without tackling discrimination in its structural, cultural, institutional, and personal manifestations. My fourth premise is that the context within which we are operating, whether or not we care to acknowledge it, is the legacy of empire and of British and European imperialism and colonialism. Part of that legacy is the racism that is embedded within the very DNA of the nation, determining government policies, institutional behavior, and structural arrangements that impact all people in the, notion, in the nation, not just black people, including those who spout utter foolishness about wanting the country back as if someone had carelessly handed it over to immigrants or leased it to Europe. It is a context in which the society validates white people automatically, while expecting, if not demanding, that black people, the othered, prove themselves before they could be considered competent, capable, trustworthy, and eligible to be included. Citizenship tests and the demand for evidence of subscribing to fundamental British values, whatever those might be, and whatever makes them quintessentially British, is but an extension of all that. Black deficit, as Robbie Shilliam noted, has a very long history, and academics who were and are considered eminent have contributed massively to the per perpetuation of it. It still informs the mindset of leaders and managers and frames their expectations of black people. As Professor Francis said, 30 years ago, 1989, after Margaret Thatcher announced the abolition of the ILEA and required the 12 inner London boroughs to set up the infrastructure for running their own schools and colleges, I was appointed director of education in Hackney. By then, I had been an education manager for seven years in Manchester, and an assistant education officer and head of community education in the ILEA. As those London boroughs prepared to add education to the local authority services for which they were responsible, they had the option of using the services of the London residuary body, an entity established to ease the transfer of functions, including payroll from the ILEA to the individual boroughs. Good old Hackney, principally for macho reasons, and in order to demonstrate that they were not the incompetent and wacko council they were made out to be, 
insisted on running their own payroll service from the outset. And from the outset, they began to pay monthly salaries to former ILEA staff who were long since dead, <coughs> while those who left their beds daily to go to work in the borough schools and colleges went without pay. Lo and behold, all the head teachers in the borough, 95% of whom were white, even though 57% of the students were not, got together and passed a vote of no confidence in the director of education. They knew damn well that I had nothing to do with Hackney's finance department because that was the domain of the director of finance. But they were so adamant that this black man could not run the education service in the borough because no black person had ever done so anywhere in the UK that they saw the borough's payroll disaster as proof of their skepticism. Hackney could have employed any Tom, Dick, or Harry, Mary, Jane, or Sue, who was white, as director of education. And those head teachers would not have, a, have automatically assumed that the payroll failure had anything to do with that person's capacity to do the job. But even before I got my feet under the director's desk, they were hell-bent on making Gus John just gone. <laughs> the irony is that the week before, Her Majesty's Inspectorate, HMI, predecessors of Ofsted, had asked me to go to the Department of Education to be briefed by them on the state of the Hackney schools I was about to inherit from the ILEA. At the end of one full day of briefings, they presented me with a list of 13 schools that were seriously failing children and that the government would shut if I could not turn them around within some ridiculous time frame. All of those 13 schools had white head teachers who had all been signatories to the vote of no confidence in the director. I ended up, for the sake of the children of, of Hackney, sacking four of them. Nowadays, I suppose Hackney would have put all its head teachers through some inane, unconscious bias training, an exercise akin to dipping sheep, in keeping with that tried and tested British practice, which I love, of calling a spade an axe. The Hackney head teachers were acting in a wholly racist manner in the willful attribution of the failures of the finance department to me, simply because those failings provided evidence of the stereotypical expectations of incapacity and failure on my part for no other reason than that I was black and in their eyes most likely deficient. Their conduct had nothing whatsoever to do with unconscious bias. So the decision of the coalition government to abandon the specific duties of the Race Relations Amendment Act 2000, for example, to have in place and publish an equality policy and action plan and to conduct equality impact assessments, the decision to abolish all of that as evidence of the insistence of getting rid of red tape was in essence a green light to public bodies to adopt a minimalist approach to promoting race equality and combating discrimination in its various manifestations, structural, cultural, institutional, personal. And as if the failure to combat discrimination on the axis of race and its intersection with other characteristics was not inexcusable enough, another euphemism and policy diversion was suddenly introduced into the lexicon unconscious or implicit bias. Now in my book, unconscious bias is a euphemism for indirect discrimination and the, hege the hegemonic externalization of the power to exclude, typecast, essentialize, and marginalize, if not to demonize. The exercise of unconscious bias often includes a range of many aggressions that express superiority, cultural supremacy, intolerance, and even contempt. Unconscious bias training has developed into an industry 
not unlike racism awareness training in an earlier era. This is not a time for a, cri for a serious critical uh, critique of unconscious bias and what constitutes the content and often problematic delivery of such training, except to say that like racism awareness training before it, its focus is almost exclusively on individuals and their behavior, and the extent to which such behavior could be considered knowing, willful, and deliberate, or simply the result of socialization and the process of normalizing in society. It is normal to see men as aeroplane pilots, crane operators, and neurosurgeons. One would not immediately assume, therefore, that the person you would hear introducing themselves as the captain of your transatlantic flight would be a woman. So all of that goes to form the context of this decolonization agenda. Students of the global African and Asian diaspora especially are demanding more now than ever before. In March 2014, at this very university, a groundbreaking seminar was held, chaired by the Provost Professor Michael Arthur. Titled, Why Isn't My Professor Black? It addressed the question as to why it was then that of the UK's 18,510 university professors, only 85 were black or of black African origin, and of those, only 17 were female. This was quickly followed by a growing movement for change in higher education with a focus on the content and orientation of curriculum and the question, why is my curriculum white? Since then, the student-led Smuts Must Fall campaign in South Africa and the Rose Must Fall initiative in the UK have coalesced and become movements that have refo refocused the higher education sector on decoloniality. Decolonizing the curriculum remains a strange demand for many academics and anecdotally some resist engagement with what that should mean for them and their pedagogy seeing it as a fad that is likely to disturb business as usual until universities are allowed to return to business as usual. Recently, I was bemused to hear an otherwise highly respected dean of studies argue passionately at a colloquium I attended that decolonizing the curriculum is a left-wing indulgence that at its root undermines the very concept of academic freedom. You will no doubt remember the protracted debate in the media about the Rose Must Fall campaign and the clamor from students that those statues adorning the corridors of the academy that celebrate white imperialists and eugenicists should be removed. While all of that was going on, I was haunted by the image. You will remember it televised more often than I could count, of a larger-than-life statue of Saddam Hussein with a noose around his neck being pulled down by the would-be liberators of the people of Iraq. Now, my imagination runs wild sometimes, conjuring images of students equally unceremoniously decapitating Cecil Rhodes, Francis Galton, Charles Spearman, and many more besides, but pigs may fly. Professor Robbie Shilliam in the paper I quoted above says as follows, campaigns to decolonize the British Academy are under attack and critics have provided the set of defenses for the Academy as such. Universities, they argue, should be sites of free thought and free speech. And the so-called right of students not to be offended is detrimental to the ethos of these sites. Hence, taking offense at a white curriculum and a white institutional space is considered a form of cultural policing driven by a desire to censor history, literature, politics, and culture. He was commenting on a Guardian article by Andrew Anthony, 
in 2016 entitled, Is Free Speech in British Universities Under Threat? There are many teachers, lecturers, and researchers who are empathetic and do not see colonizing the curriculum as interfering with academic freedom. But they are unsure of what a decolonized curriculum should look like. They invariably call for a toolkit as a guide to what to do and not do in curriculum planning, delivery, and review. The problem, though, is that practical steps, while undoubtedly helpful, do not by themselves lead to a change of mindset, or better yet, to use the very helpful Paolo Freire phrase or, or concept, conscientization, such that academics are led to interrogate their own socialization into ways of seeing the world outside Europe, into Eurocentric philosophies and epistemologies, and the origin of much of what we teach, into the source of their own power, especially when they are white and male. Arguably, the biggest obstacle in all this is the failure of the academy and the need of the society itself to problematize whiteness and the historical basis of white supremacy. People teach people through teaching subjects, and they do so within a set of societal norms, expectations, and learned behaviors. All of the latter influence their pedagogy. Teachers and students are both learners, and there are power dynamics involved in that interactive process. Those dynamics frame expectations, choices, cultures, cultural and political histories, and ways of being in the world. I'm one of those old-fashioned Frarians who retain a fundamental belief in the importance of conscientization and of interrogating our taken-for-granted assumptions about being in the world and therefore about the realities of the other, especially given the dynamics of power, ideology, and hegemony that so govern our understandings and behaviors. Before a toolkit could be useful, therefore, academics must deconstruct themselves and their own identity formation, national origins, cultural assumptions, values base, and level of knowledge of other people's social and economic relations. We have a personal imperative to deconstruct ourselves in order that we could sensibly deconstruct the curriculum we choose to design and deliver. Decolonizing is not only in respect of the hegemony of Eurocentric epistemologies and the eclipsing of histories, philosophies, and worldviews other than those framed by imperialism. It is also about the way the construction and validation of knowledge has been appropriated by ruling elites to the exclusion of workers and peasants, their voices and creative products in pretty much any society. Higher education has played and continues to play a key role in perpetuating coloniality. So what does that then mean for, for us? How are we to approach this vexing issue. In the 1960s and 70s, children of Caribbean parents were being discriminated against and considered dunce, simply because they were using their home language, the only language they knew, when communicating with their teachers and their peers, rather than the Queen's English. Racist tropes about the intellectual capacity of black children were liberally employed both by schools and the government itself. For example, I was one of those who, in the early 1970s, was campaigning against the practice of busing children away from their own residential areas to other schools. Despite the well-known patterns of settlement in inner city areas among Caribbean migrants, the Department for Education authorized local education authorities to bus black children away from their own residential areas to other schools once their numbers in local schools had reached 
the government claimed to be responding to the anxieties of both students, both, both teachers and parents, about the progress of white students being stunted, and that's the word they used, by the presence of larger numbers of presumably dunce and potentially educationally subnormal black students. All of this was compounded by the work of academics such as Cyril Burt, Hans Eysenck, Arthur Jensen, and other eugenicists and biological racists who were propounding theories on race and intelligence and whose work, believe it or not, was being widely used shamelessly in teacher education across Britain. So Cyril Burt produced a whole number of tests Tests which were used for the 11 plus, for example. And they determined the life chances of those who passed the 11 plus and disastrously of those who failed. Those tests and other IQ tests were to influence teacher, student, and parent expectations, pedagogy, curriculum, and schooling outcomes for generations to come. They were especially toxic when used with children from the African diaspora. Uh, Bernard Cord, in his book, his seminal work, How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British School System, published in 1971 by New Beacon Books, quoted some government statistics which showed that in 1966, there were 13.2% immigrant pupils in ordinary schools, but 23.3% in ESN schools. By 1967, that figure, spring 1967, that figure had risen. 54% 54 of pupils in ordinary schools were West Indian, but 75% of pupils in ESN schools were West Indian. And he argues that there were a series of biases that uh, these tests and those who administered them were applying to, to black children. So how do we then embed decolonizing practice against that history? I believe that this requires individuals to focus upon and it requires more group and institution-wide conversations about the following things. The legacy of European imperialism and colonialism, epistemologies framed in the global north and constructions of the global south, construction and validation of knowledge, definition of acceptable and invalid bases of knowledge, contested ways of being in the world, philosophies and their origins, Phenomeno phenomenology and existentialism in understanding the world of the student, whatever the background, decolonization of the self, and in that looking at mindsets, socialized understandings of the self in relation to others, values, their origins and expression, ideology and power, identity formation, knowledge transfer as distinct from knowledge exchange in the teaching process, and of course, pedagogy and epistemology in terms of curriculum, teaching, learning, and assessment. And what that leads to, in my view, is the need to confront orthodoxy and dogma by challenging our own academic orthodoxy and what it excludes, presupposes and presents as valid and validated. So being clear about the basis on which we make choices about what to include in reading lists and the messages that are conveyed thereby, being alert to the extent to which the choices we make could exclude perspectives that are perhaps more relevant and more challenging of taking for granted orthodoxies than those with which we are more comfortable and regard as superior. Being prepared to review, revise, or even set aside curriculum that we regard as tried and tested and to rebuild curriculum from the bottom and a whole number of other things besides that I've got listed here which I don't have time to go into just now. I have no doubt that the decolonization discourse will preoccupy academics for some considerable time. <laughs> 
But it would be a pity if it remains a conversation amongst people in the academy and does not impact upon education and public policy formulation and practice. Foremost in our minds must always be questions such as, how does what we do in academia in interrogating and refining such constructs impact upon the practice of education and framing of historical stories? the treatment of populations in all their diversity and multiple identities in a globalized world and economic and trade policies and operations. Decoloniz decolonization will, will become more than a theory only when it is embraced as a weapon of struggle in the academy itself and a tool of liberation for the masses who through their collective action and power undermine and disrupt the hegemony of class, caste, and ethnicity, whiteness in particular, that keep them in their place and render them dependent consumers of other people's epistemologies, ideologies, and products. The higher education sector is proving itself painfully slow in engaging with students in that struggle, rather than just finding ways to co-opt the struggle. So I end with a quotation from Robbie, Sh Robbie Shilliam again. He says, I conclude with a provocation. Those traditions of thought on the black presence which have categorically refuted the colonial and racialized premise of black deficit have tended to consolidate outside of the academy proper. Contra contemporary critics the academy is not threatened by black deficit. Rather, the academy has yet to accept black intellectual competence. Current projects to decolonize the British Academy and to de-whiten its spaces and canons must be critically assessed by reference to the substance of imperial history rather than the fantasy of an adject adjective-free safe space for intellectual advance. This, my friends, is what I believe the challenge to be. And until we turn all of this thing on its head and reimagine what we are doing when we teach and prepare curriculum and assess people on the basis of that teaching, we would constantly be a sector that is continuing to perpetuate coloniality rather than freeing people so that they could use the spaces that are these higher education institutions to bring about the kind of human liberation I was talking about. Thank you for listening.